We're live, Dane. Thank you. At this time, Lord Sergeant, please start your recording. PC recording has started. Thank you. Cloud recording is good. Thank you. Sergeant Biondo, you may begin with your opening statement, sir. Good afternoon and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing on the Committee of Housing and Buildings. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. Once again, all panelists, please turn on your video for verification purposes. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. And we also ask your cooperation in silencing your cell phones for the duration of the hearing. Thank you for your cooperation, Chair. We're ready to begin. Uh, thank you so much. Um, let me gavel in. Good afternoon. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegy, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. Thank you all for joining this hearing titled Oversight, COVID-19 and Reopening Commercial Spaces. In March, as a in March, as the number of COVID-19 cases in the city began to surge, Governor Cuomo issued an executive order requiring the closure of all non-essential businesses. Since then, countless commercial spaces across the city have remained vacant, with some slowly becoming reoccupied as restrictions ease with each phase of reopening. While the closure of these spaces was an effective measure to mitigate the person-to-person -person spread of COVID-19, the number of infections in the city has started to rise again. Further, as reported by the New York Times just yesterday, recent clusters of infections may be traced to workplaces. Today, the committee will hear from the building, Department of Buildings about the city's efforts to effectively enforce guidelines from federal, state, and city health authorities on how to reduce the risk of COVID-19 transmission in commercial spaces. The committee will also be hearing intro number 2033, which I sponsor. This bill would allow the Department of Buildings to issue interim certificates of occupancy for certain buildings undergoing permitted construction work. I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Committee on Housing and Buildings present. Today, in no particular order, we have Council Member Jonai, Torres, Lewis, Chin, Gredenchik, Rosenthal, Perkins, and Cabrera. No particular order, Pastor. <laughs> we'll now hear an opening statement uh, from my friend, Public, Adv Public Advocate Jamani Williams. Got to unmute Jamani. Thank you so much. Can anybody hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Peace and blessing to everyone. My name is Jamani Williams. As mentioned, I'm the public advocate for the city of New York. I want to thank Chair Carnegie uh, and all the members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings for holding this hearing on COVID-19 and the reopening of commercial spaces. Uh, the coronavirus has impacted the way in which many areas of our economy operate, including commercial buildings. The city provided a reopening guidance on commercial building management, which mandates that buildings ensure that workers stay home and free, wear a face covering, practice healthy hand hygiene, and implement physical distancing. While these guidelines are important, they lack key health and safety standards. The guidance does not include any protocol on health screenings, nor does it include any mandates on testing and tracing, which are essential in ensuring that the workers and patrons of these buildings remain safe and healthy. The state's guidance on commercial building management, on the other hand, does mandate health screening assessments and also requires commercial non-residential buildings to have a plan for contact tracing in the event of a positive case. While the state's inclusion of this requirement is commendable, we do not know how it is being enforced. Therefore, we cannot say for certain how effective it is. This inconsistency between the city and the state demonstrates a divergence of messaging, which has been a problem as long as this pandemic has been going on in and of itself. Although our city is on the path to recovery and commercial establishments, establishments are reopening, we cannot forget that COVID-19 will continue to impact our businesses, especially as we risk entering a second stage. Therefore, we must make certain that businesses have adequate guidance to help them prevent the spread of the coronavirus. Uh, my bill in show number 2125 would do just that. 
This bill would require the Commissioner of Emergency Management in consultation with the Commissioner of Small Business Services, the Commissioner of Health and Mental Hygiene, and other agency heads with relevant expertise to develop informational guides for the purpose of facilitating and supporting the safe reopening of New York City businesses to prevent the spread of and spread of and infections caused by COVID-19. This informational guidance is intended to be used as a planning resource for operators and owners of New York City businesses. Data that is to be incorporated into the guidance includes formation, information regarding federal, state, local laws and regulations related to reopening businesses after the COVID-19 pandemic. Recommended best practices to help reduce the risk of exposure to COVID-19 and to limit its spread, such as flexible work sites and hours and other considerations deemed necessary by the Commissioner of Emergency Management to the reopening of businesses. The guidance, which will be published on the Office of Emergency Management website in English, and the most commonly spoken languages of affected communities is to be reviewed regularly and updated as needed. This piece of legislation will create a guidance that goes further than that of the city and the state because it will create a set of standards tailored specifically for businesses in our city. And it will be consistent with the current developments on how best to contain the virus. I would also like to highlight Chair Carnegie's bill, intro number 23, 2033, which would allow the Department of Buildings to issue interim certificates of occupancy to authorize the occupancy of specific floors of a building prior to comp completion of permanent construction work on the building. Many commercial spaces have conducted repairs and safety renovations during COVID-19, such as replacing ventilation systems or putting in plexiglass and have to navigate those restorations while opening uh, their uh, commercial spaces at the same time. By providing interim certificates of occupancy, this piece of legislation will give businesses the ability to reopen certain floors in a building, even if the work needed to obtain a CFO for the building has not yet completed. This bill allows business to restart operations in a safe manner as possible, even if they are undergoing necessary renovations. So I thank the chair for his leadership on this issue, uh, this bill in particular. After restrictions were lifted, many of our city's commercial spaces put forth the efforts to reopen safely, even with the limited guidance provided to them from the administration and the state. However, it is our responsibility as public officials to make certain that our business owners have the information and resources needed to ensure healthy operations during this pandemic. I look forward to hearing what the Department of Buildings has, uh, what have they've done to take in the steps that are needed toward the same objectives. At minimum, we should be providing plans, uh, not just uh, providing something the day before a holiday or uh, seems like we're doing some of this stuff uh, ad hoc. I just want to shout out uh, Dr. Gounder, Gounder, who was just uh, appointed to uh, President Biden-elect's task force on coronavirus. Uh, she has given us much guidance in this uh, in the public advocate's office uh, as we uh, made policy recommendations. I wish our local leaders uh, had as much wisdom uh, to use what she was presenting as well. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you uh, to the members as well. Thank you, Public Advocate. Um, I believe that we'll now hear from um, our committee council. Yep, thanks, Chair Carnegie. Um, before we start, and I think you may have mentioned these two, but I wanna acknowledge that we're also joined by council members Torres and Perkins. Um, thank you, I'm Austin, I'm Austin Brantford. I'm counsel to the City Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. Before we begin, I wanna remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including responses. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from members of the public. Today, we will hear from Department of Buildings Commissioner Melanie LaRocca. I will now administer the oath. Commissioner LaRocca, please raise your right hand, thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? One minute. Yes. Great, thank you. You may be getting ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Carnegie and members of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm Melanie LaRocca, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I'm pleased to be here uh, to discuss the reopening of commercial spaces and legislation that would create an interim certificate of occupancy. I thank this committee for holding a hearing on this important issue. It's critical that commercial buildings take measures to protect against the spread of COVID-19. This pandemic has had an unimaginable impact on many aspects of our lives and, and has certainly impacted our work at the department. Um, our priority during this pandemic is of course to keep the public safe, which is our priority every day, uh, notwithstanding pandemics. 
Uh, while we're now working to ensure that construction sites are abiding by guidelines to protect against the spread of COVID-19, we're also continuing our work to keep active construction sites and the city's over 1 million buildings safe. This includes holding our construction sites to the highest safety standards to continue to drive down construction related incidences, injuries and fatalities, as well as performing proactive inspections to ensure that required safety measures are in place to protect tenants residing in buildings undergoing construction. I am so very proud of the work uh, that our staff has been doing throughout this pandemic and truly can uh, commend them for their hard work uh, and dedication they've shown to not only the department and the city as a whole. Uh, this uh, department's primary focus during this pandemic has been to enforce guidelines at construction sites intended to protect against the spread of COVID-19. While most construction work was deemed non-essential by the state government in the early days of the pandemic, some construction was in fact deemed essential and allowed to continue. For example, emergency construction necessary to protect the health and safety of building occupants and the essential construction of certain buildings like hospitals and schools was allowed to continue. The department issued guidance to the construction industry to clarify the types of essential construction work that could continue and our inspectors visited all construction sites to ensure that they were only working if they were performing essential construction work. We also published a detailed FAQ, which answered most common questions we were receiving from the construction industry and released maps on our website to provide the public with the tools they could use to determine if permitted construction work was in fact essential or non-essential. In June, our construction sites began reopening subject to guidelines issued by the department as well as the state government. While construction work is now allowed to continue, it looks a little different today. Workers on construction sites must be physically distanced where possible, must wear appropriate face coverings, occupancy limits must be observed for tightly confined spaces, and hand hygiene stations must be readily accessible to workers at all times. Signage must also be posted throughout a site reminding workers to adhere to proper hand hygiene physical distancing rules and appropriate use of personal protective equipment. Since these guidelines were issued, our inspectors have been visiting construction sites proactively to ensure that they are being followed. Similar to the guidelines issued by the state government for various industries, dedicated guidelines have been issued for the management of commercial buildings as they continue to operate or reopen. These guidelines are available on the state's website. Building owners and managers must adhere to these guidelines and submit an affirmation to the state government indicating that they will operate in accordance with said guidelines. Additionally, a safety plan that addresses all aspects of these guidelines must be developed and posted in the building. While the detailed guidelines are available online, I'd like to highlight a few key requirements that commercial buildings must follow. Occupants must be physically distanced or wear appropriate face coverings if physical distancing is not possible. Practices to maintain physical distancing in small areas like restrooms must be implemented. Occupants must be provided with appropriate personal protective equipment. Before reopening a building, building systems, including mechanical systems, elevators, and HVAC systems must be checked to ensure they're operating properly. The building must be regularly cleaned and disinfected with a focus on frequently touched surfaces and signage must be posted throughout the building to remind occupants to adhere to proper hygiene, physical distancing rules and proper and appropriate use of protect, personal protective equipment. Now turning our attention to intro 2033, which creates a new type of temporary certificate of occupancy an interim certificate of occupancy. A certificate of occupancy states a building's legal use and or type of permitted occupancy. A building may not be legally occupied until the department has issued a CFO or a TCO. A TCO is issued with respect to a building that is safe for occupancy, but where there are outstanding issues requiring final approval. TCOs typically expire 90 days after they're issued, which means buildings rely on TCOs uh, being renewed periodically, even though the building itself may be partially occupied. 
This legislation would create an interim CFO, which would not expire and which would be issued with respect to certain portions of the building when the department determines that such portions are safe for occupancy. An interim CFO will only be issued after the department performs an inspection to verify compliance with the New York City construction codes and confirms that there are no outstanding issues requiring further approval or violations to be removed with respect to that portion of the building. Further, an interim CBO will only be issued to a building of non-combustible construction that is protected with an automatic sprinkler system and where adequate means of egress are provided. I urge the committee to pass this legislation as it will result in time savings for the industry, streamlining the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for new buildings and add certainty to a project for building owners securing needed financing for their developments. This legislation will also add certainty to commercial and residential tenants moving into a space relying on an interim CFO because there are no outstanding issues requiring department approval for that space and that type of TCO issued by the department for that space will not expire. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Carnegie. But as a reminder, if council members other than Chair Carnegie have any questions for the administration, please, write, please use the Zoom raise hand function. I will call on you in order. Chair Carnegie, if you're ready, go ahead and begin. Okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. It's always a pleasure to work with you. Uh, it's been a refreshing change since you've been uh, the chair. Uh, to work with, we, I think we, I feel like we've gotten a lot, of, a lot done, and look forward to in this last year getting a lot more done. Thank you, Chair. Um, Feeling is mutual. Thank you. Uh, how many commercial buildings have reopened in New York City, and uh, what kind of commercial buildings have reopened? Do you, do you have that? So I don't have the specifics of how many and what type, but I will say, um, as it relates to the department's uh, work uh, uh, with respect to COVID compliance where we've been focusing our efforts has been around active construction sites. And I will say certainly uh, uh, it is true that many of our uh, permitted construction sites are in uh, occupied buildings, meaning uh, uh, work in uh, non new building setting where you're not doing ground up uh, uh, work. And for the most part, what I've heard from my inspectors is that they're encountering staff within the building that has been able to facilitate their entrance. So we do know that during uh, New York pause, uh, the governor did have uh, um, non-essential uh, businesses closed. So we do know a portion of that time, uh, we did not see tenants in those spaces. So I, I would really like to see those numbers. I think it's essential in us going forward in any like kind of structured way. Uh, what do you think we could do to get those numbers? And, and I'm assuming you meant that it's just not compiled, not that you don't have it today. As I understand it, you're right, uh, Chair, it is not a number that is compiled. I'm certainly happy to make this department available to facilitate. We have, throughout the entire pandemic, I think it's fair to say nobody expected we'd be where we are today, uh, you know, eight months later, having a conversation around uh, this worldwide pandemic, or, or at least certainly I didn't think we'd be having the kind of conversation we have, but we've seen time and time again while the department's main mission is active construction uh, sites, our, as well as keeping the uh, public safe um, uh, with respect to the over 1 million buildings, I've seen my staff every day step up and, and provide help uh, to the city as we go through this together, really embracing the all hands on deck feeling of we've got great competent people, let's put them to use. Um, to try to stem the, uh, the spread of COVID-19. So certainly this department stands at the ready to participate in any additional way to help. So I know that the administration has made a solid commitment to recovery and resiliency as it relates to everything from building to supporting small businesses. I think one of the ways we could do that is if we could compile uh, that data around which buildings are, you know, which commercial spaces are open and occupied, uh, which aren't. Um, with, with those numbers, I think we can probably move more effectively and efficiency in a direction of recovery and resiliency. So, and, and I'm willing to, uh, from my office's perspective and from this uh, committee's perspective, uh, however we can be helpful in that. Um, I think 
like, you know, speaking about recovery and resiliency without having those numbers at the ready um, leaves us at a little bit of a disadvantage. So I'd love to be able to move forward in that way. Sure. Um, so yesterday, the New York Times reported that clusters of COVID-19 infections in the city can be traced to workplaces, including construction sites and offices. What is the city doing to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 in these spaces? Yeah, so with respect to the to the Times article, I'm certainly happy to, to bring in our colleagues at the Department of Health uh, for specifics around this. Obviously, I will just state for the record the work the department has done uh, over the course of the last eight months with respect to um, uh, COVID awareness on job sites, as well as the work we've done to ensure that the appropriate uh, protocols are in place on sites. And so you've seen the department go out um, and share information with work sites around uh, the state's reopening plan, the state's guidance to allow for construction to reopen, the city's guidance on top of that as well. Um, and ensuring that when our inspectors walk sites, we are looking for those COVID requirements. So uh, uh, for the specifics on, on that, I have to defer to my colleagues at health, but certainly this department has really embraced um, and, and expanded uh, role for us when it comes to active job sites. So uh, as, thank you. As the number of cases in the city continues to climb, is the city planning to release updated, updated guidance or pursue more aggressive enforcement of existing guidance. So I, I you know, I follow along and I watch uh, both uh, the mayor's and the governor's briefings regularly. Um, but sometimes it becomes incredibly confusing, even to me as a legislator, what the guidance is. Small businesses and these commercial spaces um, are really struggling to understand as things change rapidly. Like we've gone to, you know, openings to closings. Uh, is there a more comprehensive guidance that we can look forward to out of the administration? Yeah, I'm gonna bring it back to active sites. And I think what we did here was a very good example of what you're talking about, Chair, where, you know, our, again, our, our focus, our mission is um, on active sites. Obviously our inspectors have joined the likes of sanitation, HPD, TLC, and others who are um, really lending a hand to this uh, all hand uh, on deck approach to helping uh, inform the public of what the rules are and make sure we all stay safe. But I think to your point, what we've done here very successfully, I believe is one, start at the education level. When construction, um, uh, when the governor uh, banned uh, all non-essential construction, we went into a mode of ensuring that that was being complied with. But once um, the ban had been lifted in June, we really took that full month of June to make sure sites understood what we were coming to inspect, that they understood what the COVID rules were that the state um, uh, laid out in their guidance, and that we took the entire month to really go above and beyond our traditional practice, which is saying the rules are what they are and you have to familiarize yourself, but saying we're gonna do outreach, we're gonna make sure you have actual material that tells you very clearly what the expectations from this department are. And we're going to not only give it to the person on site, but we're gonna make sure the licensed professional who designed that job, as well as the permit holder who went out and got that permit, as well as the owner of the site, were all in communication with us. And so we sent out weekly communications to all um, license holder, permit holders um, on just generally what we were seeing as a result of our inspections. Um, as well as targeted uh, weekly correspondence with sites where we conducted an inspection and found an issue with one of the COVID-19 safety requirements we were specifically going out to inspect. So I think that resulted in very good compliance come July when we started issuing monetary violations for um, uh, uh, infractions of the COVID-19 requirements and our monetary violations were pretty steep. We we're talking about $5,000 violation and the ability to have a stop work order issued uh, if certain um, requirements were not in place. So we think that really worked well um, and should be a very good example for uh, how the city um, has been working to educate and then ensure that there's appropriate enforcement. Right, so that my, my next question uh, before I move to my colleagues was around uh, enforcement, and I think you may have addressed some of it in your, in your last comments, but in addition to any city and state guidance, 
This, I'm sorry, in any city guidance, the Department of Health for the state has released the interim guidance for building management during COVID-19 public health. Is that guidance by, binding? And if so, how are the requirements being enforced? So, so this, this speaks more to just the, the building and commercial spaces as opposed to the, the, the really tough and stringent rules and enforcement that you've put around construction sites. Right. And again, you know, owners at the at the end of the day, owners are required to make sure that they are aware of the guidance. So um, as with other state issued guidance, there's affirmations that must be completed by ownership um, to attest to the fact that they a understand the state's guidance and b are in fact operating in accordance um, with said guidance. And obviously the city Department of Health has issued uh, uh, guidance around this world as well. So um, we think the appropriate uh, rules are out there. Um, and, you know, again, bringing it back to our experience, we know um, uh, that folks are familiar with the rules uh, uh, and, uh, you know, are certainly eager to get back out there. I'm sorry, really lastly, what, it, um, what triggers uh, an inspection? Is it a, is it a 311 call? Is it, is it just a, um, you know, priority that you're going out to make these inspections? What, what triggers the, the follow-up and or inspection on these guidances, whether sure. or not they're being adhered to? They certainly can happen through 311. We've gotten plenty of complaints that way, and that is the appropriate tool um, to direct city agencies uh, to an issue, whether it be with respect to commercial spaces and uh, the lack of adherence potentially um, to the state's guidance or any other um, COVID-specific uh, provision. So certainly 311 is definitely the right tool. Thank you. So um, I guess we can uh, move uh, committee council if you're ready to begin to look at the stack and call some of my colleagues. Sure. I first want to mention that we've also been joined by council member Rivera. Uh, I'll now be, I'll now call on council members to ask questions in order they've used the zoom raise hand function. Mm -hmm. Council members, please keep your questions to three minutes, including responses. If there's a second round of questioning, questions will be limited to two minutes, including responses. A sergeant at arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. We had a question from Council Member Cabrera. Yes. Right. Time starts now. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I'm going to make it really quick because I just want to take a moment to thank the commissioner uh, for your level of accessibility during COVID-19. Uh, the couple of times that I did call you about some issues and work sites, uh, you were so accessible and moved so quickly. Uh, and so I want to thank you. You are Truly, I want to echo the words of the chair, a breath of uh, fresh air uh, upon the department, and thank you for your leadership. Thank you. With that, I give it back to the chair. Thank you, council member. Pleasure is mine. Uh, seeing no additional hands raised from council members, we can circle back to the chair for any additional questions if you have them. Yes. Um, so how long would it take for a commercial space to reopen? while following these requirements? Is there any associated costs? And how are these requirements uh, being enforced? So as I understand it, the state's guidance um, uh, from our read, from my read of it, probably don't have very much of an impact. There are very specific um, uh, parameters that they talk about in the guidance with respect to PPE, ensuring that there is appropriate face coverings, which again, outside of commercial, uh, office space owners or owners, excuse me, of commercial office space, spaces, we see this um, similar provision across um, even back into active construction sites where all workers are required to wear face coverings and such, uh, uh, such face coverings are a requirement of the employee to give that out to the personnel if they don't have it. So you have face covering provisions, you have provisions around the systems just to ensure that they're operating, particularly if you've had a building close uh, for a very long time. I'm not sure um, that we have many buildings that fall in that category, but again, that's just sort of answer, you know what we hear from inspectors in the field. Um, and then there are other provisions in the state's guidance that speak to ensuring you have appropriate social distancing um, and requirements around tightly confined spaces, which again, bringing it back to an active site, those are themes that exist there and there's really not a very significant cost associated with those very specific things. 
Uh, most commercial spaces have been closed for many months. And an example is our legislative offices at 250 Broadway. Uh, has the city studied how a lack of regular use may affect building components such as mechanical, elevator, water, and HVAC systems? I know that as a homeowner, um, if I don't use it, you know, a lot of times uh, uh, sediment and all, all kinds of different things can affect the systems that are germane to running just a private home. In a large scale office building, you know, I would imagine that there are that are that there are some systems that should be operated regularly. And and and, and this time there's been a changeover from heat to air um, that 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 hasn't taken place. Um, I'm just imagining that um, as we go back, you know, or get ready to go back in these buildings, are there any health? First of all, has the study been done, and do you anticipate health risks from not running everything from HVAC systems to to water to mechanical systems? Yeah, I'm not aware if, if somebody has undertaken a study, but certainly, you know, the, the state's guidance do speak to to that point exactly, Chair, where you want, if, if a building has been shut and systems have been closed, right? 250 Broadway, your legislative office is a very good example where tenants have not occupied the space, um, but certainly there's been some base building staff who have been there. And, and I can say from my inspectors in the field where we've gone out to uh, visit sites that have an active permit. Many active permits exist in occupied buildings, some of which are um, purely commercial space. We know that tenants weren't there. We had been doing that as part of our efforts to participate in the city's um, COVID response around occupancy, ensuring that, that entities were following the state's um, a ban on non-essential businesses. And then later, as we were doing um, inspections to ensure that permitted sites were not, uh, were not being activated during the ban on non-essential. And then when we transitioned over into all construction being allowed, making sure that the requirements were in place. So we know in those three phases at minimum that while tenants didn't occupy spaces, very many um, commercial office buildings did have base um, staff on board to ensure that the, the mechanical systems, uh, uh, water, things of that nature continued to run um, even if the tenants weren't there. Yeah. Obviously at a different level, I should say. That, that just be very clear. All systems were not, were not fully uh, operational, but, but you get the point. I think we, we've encountered certainly from my folks uh, a number of spaces where where base folks were there, base building staff were there. So, just my, my last question, uh, Commissioner, is: so we're we're basically not not issuing any particular guidance from the city. We're just following the state's guidances on um, on on those systems and those kinds of things. Yeah, the state's guidance, the city Department of Health put it out there. I think those are pretty comprehensive with respect to uh, to ensuring that the um, uh, base systems are uh, uh, in good standing order. Uh, thank you, I, I, have, I have no further questions, uh, committee council. Sure, and seeing no further questions from other council members, we will now turn to testimony from members of the public. Thank you, commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, commissioner. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a, number, a member of our staff will unmute you and a sergeant at arms will set the timer to announce you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. I would like to now welcome Laura Rothrock, followed by Theo Chino with translator Ghislaine Sabidi and then Ryan Winnell. Laura. Time starts now. Laura, you're still muted. Sorry about that. There go. Good afternoon, Councilmember Cornegie and members of the New York City Council Committee on Housing and Buildings. My name is Laura Rothrock and I'm providing testimony on behalf of the New York, New York Coalition of Code Consultants, also known as NYCCC. NYCCC is a nonprofit trade organization whose members specialize in securing construction and development approvals from municipal agencies, as well as building code and zoning consulting. I'm testifying today in support of intro 2033, which allows DOB to create an interim certificate of occupancy. The combined companies of NYCCC make up the largest users of the Department of Building Services. We work closely with DOB on behalf of our clients to ensure compliance and safety. 
As an organization, we have regular discussions with DOB and city council to share feedback and discuss ways in which DOB and the industry can work together more efficiently without compromising safety. We thank council member Carnegie for his leadership on intro 2033. This bill, if passed, will allow Department of Buildings more flexibility to authorize occupancy of specific floors of a building prior to completion of permitted construction work in the building. This new policy is logical in practice when one or more floors might be completely finished and there's no reason for an inspector to reinspect portions of a building that were already signed off. We applaud DOB for their continuous efforts to improve the filing and inspection processes and streamline compliance with limited resources. DOB's work on the interim certificate of occupancy is just one example of the agency's commitment to improving their services for all users. We look forward to continuing our discussions with DOB and city council, and we hope that we hope that you will continue using NYCCC as a resource for industry feedback. We hope you will vote in favor of this bill and thank you for your consideration. Uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, going forward, um, I want to um, I want to I don't I won't I want the people testifying to not feel compelled to read just your your remarks in their entirety. If you want to submit them for the record and then just make an impassioned statement under two minutes. Uh, that's a great way for you to get your message across, but also for us to get the prepared statement. And that, Laura, that wasn't for you because you did yours under two minutes. Thank you. In my son's bedroom. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Theo Chino with translator Ghislaine Sabidi. We'll actually be extending the testimony to five minutes to accommodate the translation. Merci beaucoup. One moment following Theo, we'll be hearing from Ryan Manel and then Ah Young Kim. But go ahead, Theo. Time Merci. starts now. Jamais depuis la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, la planète partage une peur collective, le COVID-19, qui s'est traduit par le dérèglement complet de tous les systèmes sociaux et économiques existants. So, never since uh, the, this 21 century, you have this kind of uh, pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 uh, just ruined everything. Que ce soit la fin du Boeing 747 ou celle de mon coiffeur du coin, le monde a changé. The world changed uh, since the pandemic, uh, even my hairdresser or the, the Boeing. C'est une opportunité pour vous, membres du conseil, de mettre en place un, des systèmes nouveaux et innovants. Cependant, il faut faire le bilan de l'ancien modèle, chercher les failles de notre société, Nous devons reconstruire en nous posant la question quel monde pour demain. You have to think about what's going on and how you can rebuild with the look at the past and how you can rebuild the new future with everything's going on now. Je m'adresse à vous en français aujourd'hui car il s'agit de ma langue d'origine. J'ai témoigné de nombreuses à de nombreuses reprises en anglais et il me semble que je ne suis pas compris car depuis un an Je me suis exprimé devant ce même comité comme le 22 juillet 2019 et rien n'a été accompli. I speak in French because it's my mother tongue and I, I used to speak in English during the the meeting but I feel like uh, nobody was understand me what I was saying since July 22nd I talk about and I have there is no nothing was done with that. So that's why I'm speaking in French today. En décembre 2019, nous avons finalement rencontré messieurs Fullerton et Amador, non pas parce que vous aviez envie de nous aider, mais parce que je vous avais insulté sur Twitter. So in December 2019, um, I, I, I met two people and the fact like you want to meet me is because I, on Twitter I was very rude with, rude with you, that's why you want to meet me today. Monsieur Amador a disparu sans laisser de traces et nous n'avons jamais été avertis. Lorsque je vous ai interpellé en mai, votre seul argument de défense n'était pas de rendre de vous rendre responsable de vos employés, mais de nous culpabiliser nous les victimes. So on 2019 I met uh, Mr. Amador, but since then Mr. Amador disappeared. I didn't have he didn't reach me. I never, I never have any contact with him. So that's why I'm talking with you today because I didn't have any response since then and I want to do a follow up with you. Il semblerait que mon anglais n'est pas compréhensible. Mes camarades afro-socialistes de DSA 
semble penser. Je m'adresse donc en vous en français en espérant que mes paroles aient un sens. So I think like when I speak English, you, you don't understand what I'm saying. That's why I'm speaking French. So I'm hoping with the French language is my mother tongue. You will understand me better than my English. Le maire de New York a, aidé, a été également interpellé sur l'émission de Brian Lehrer. Celui-là a également promis de l'assister. À ce jour, une personne sans domicile fixe devait être assistée par le maire. Rien n'a été fait. Par contre, l'espace commercial de la taverne de Nier, lorsque son propriétaire parla à M. de Blasio sur le même programme, votre collègue Robert Holder et Mike Miller ont tout de suite accouru l'aider. Est-ce que les locaux commerciaux seraient plus importants que les sans domicile fixe So there is an issue with the, the anomalous people and nothing was done to help him. But in, in the second part, when they have an issue with the commercial building, the mayor and everybody was about to deal with this issue. So my question is, uh, does uh, the homeless issue Is, more, is less important than the commercial building. Nous nous sommes proposés de vous aider à la création d'un comité ad hoc incluant des membres de la municipalité, des corps intermédiaires représentant les différents organismes ainsi que les représentants des victimes de la corruption de HPD. Votre réponse a été de dire à, à travers M. Fullerton que cela n'était pas nécessaire car Harvey Hapstein avait introduit une proposition de loi à Albany. So with my committee, uh, Adar, I want, I, want to, I want you to help us, but nothing was done. And I was uh, very uh, concerned about it because um, you have more, more help for the other uh, person who want to be able to- Time expired. Thank you, Theo. And any other testimony you have, you can submit for the record. Uh, 72 hours. J'avais une, j'avais une dernière phrase. You have one less, uh, one sentence to say. Il va de soi qu'il est inutile d'essayer de réouvrir les locaux commerciaux affectés par le COVID tant qu'une investigation de comble n'est pas été faite avec HPD, BOD, and DHS. When will you propose it? So, it's, uh, so my concern is, is like there is no point to open the commercial building if you don't do any invest, in, investigation with HBD and other, um, other company. What is your issue with that, if you have any solution? So uh, please let him know that unfortunately, Eddie Amador is no longer with, my, with our office. And I'm going to try to see if I can put the uh, new person who can, who can help him directly, um, Ian, Ian Fullerton. Uh, I don't, I'm trying to see if I can put this in the chat. Uh, if not, would you just take for me? It's efullerton at council.nyc.gov. Uh, he has my information. I have talked to him in the past. You know who I am. OK. But have him call me. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Ryan Manel, followed by Ayung Kim and Maria Free. Ryan. Time starts now. Well, thank you, Chair Cornegie and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ryan Manel, and I'm Director of City Legislative Affairs for the Real Estate Board of New York. Uh, we today are submitting our um, guidance in regards to the reopening of commercial buildings uh, for the record. Uh, and as always, I wanted to say how much we appreciate the ability to work with uh, the city council as well as the Department of Housing and Buildings uh, to better ensure that the safety of staff, tenants, and commercial office workers is protected at, at all times. Uh, Revenue re remains very vigilant, ready to serve in developing and implementing additional guidance and health precautions as a civic partner in the health and recovery of our great city. Uh, relative to intro 2033 in particular, Uh, REDME fully supports this legislation and thanks the Department of Buildings for our many conversations and, and continued partnership on the issue. The bill would not only help reduce delays in which buildings receive the permanent CFO and get tenants into their space faster, it will also alleviate some administrative burden on DOB, allowing the department to refocus the safety and save time and resources on the countless other matters for which it is responsible. Thank you, and uh, we will be submitting our guidance uh, to the record. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. 
Next, we'll hear from Ai Young Kim, followed by Maria Free and Abraham Gross. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Cornegie and the Committee of Housing and Buildings for convening this hearing. My name is Ai Young Kim, and I am the Associate Director of Small Business Programs at the Asian American Federation. From July to August this year, we conducted a survey to ass assess the impact of the pandemic and Asian small business owners across the state and city, and through which we collected over 400 responses. Today, I'm here to raise the awareness of the difficulty that small business owners face throughout the city in the process of enforcing COVID-19 related ins inspections, which was um, also done by um, Department of Building. Small business owners, especially those with limited English proficiency, are still struggling today to find relevant information on COVID-related regulations. During the inspection process, they are unable to communicate with inspectors who often practice inconsistent inspection standards with hostility. They're even more lost in navigating the curing process, which push pushes the most vulnerable business owners to simply just giving up on this, making this process an educational one and just paying off the fines as they are charged. The majority of survey respondents for, uh, answered that their businesses were operating in limited capacity at the time of the survey, and over 31% of them said their business was temporarily closed. Almost all business owners reported a dec decrease in revenue, 55% of them suffering from over 75% loss in revenue. Inspections on businesses have little to no language assistance today, and this is a big problem for Asian small business owners. We see slow translation, lack of engagement, and little, um, little impact to try to gauge with the hard to reach communities. During the inspection process, the hostile ins inspections that we see on the ground are creating a confusion and a, a feeling, a sensation from the small business owners that feel like they're not really um, protected by the state or city, but they're actually being targeted for any source of revenue. Time expired. Um, I have one more minute. Yes, please, finish. Thank you. And more importantly, at the end of such inspections, we do not have see any information that is available to LAP small business owners to guide them how to cure the violations or how to talk to the, uh, engage with city agencies. And they are just told to go talk to a licensed contractor when they don't know exactly who is trustworthy. And the contractors themselves are often at a conflict of interest. At the Federation, we encourage the um, City Council to actively dis disseminate information regarding violation curing process to also make sure that inspectors are being monitored for the inspection process so that the small business owners have a, have a chance to give feedback about how they're experiencing the uh, guidelines and regulations on the ground. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions and uh, look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll hear from Maria Free, followed by Abraham Gross, Lyric Thompson, and Paula Siegel. Maria? Time starts now. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Maria Free, and I'm an urban planning and policy analyst at the New York Building Congress, uh, and we are proud to support this new introduction. The Building Congress is nearly a 100-year-old organization that has worked to advocate for investment in infrastructure, job creation, and preservation and growth in the New York City area. So with our interest in addressing the critical issues of the building industry, we believe that this bill will help reduce costs, save time, and add certainty for owners and tenants alike. By not having to be renewed every 90 days, the new interim certificate of occupancy will help reduce owner's paperwork and avoid violations for failing to renew the temporary certificate. So in these unprecedented times, we believe that common sense innovations and the reduction of burdensome regulations um, like this legislation proposes are exactly what our industry needs and will help get New York City building back. A new interim certificate of occupancy will reduce paperwork and streamline the development process without diminishing safety. So we urge council to support this measure and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll next hear from Abraham Gross, followed by Lyric Thompson and Paula Siegel. Abraham. Time starts now. Abraham Gross.
All right, we will move on to Lyric Thompson, followed by Paula Siegel. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lyric Thompson, and I'm all about safety, especially with regard to buildings. And so I, I support the bills that you have uh, put forward. However, that's not the reason that I've come here today. Council Member Cornegie, um, our CFO was fraudulently signed off. Now, DOB has done their job, and I, I appreciate the commissioner. I appreciate the work of Tim, Commissioner uh, Tim Hogan. They have done their job by writing the necessary violations. However, Housing Preservation and Development refuses to clean up the mess they made while they were ignoring the laws pursuant to 421A. I find it very disturbing that I have a 421A package that is wrought with forged documents and a housing agency that seems content with being okay with said forged documents. Now, sir, you told me approximately, what, a year and a half ago, I think, to get with your chief of staff and that we would set up a meeting with HPD. Now, they are ignoring her. They, from what I have gathered, will not get back with her, which I find to be very disturbing. Now, I have provided irrefutable evidence of fraud and malfeasance by HPD. Why is this not being taken seriously? How is it in the best interest of our city and our citizens to not take this seriously? And why don't we choose to do the other, which is to take it seriously? I, I would appreciate an answer. I, I don't just come to these hearings because, you know, it's fun. I mean, not that you guys aren't, you know, fun, but I, I need answers to these questions. So, are you willing to provide said answers? What can we do? I mean, I I challenge anybody within the sound of my voice, Google Willie Zambrano. He's a, a very reputable uh, architect in this city. He's also a professor. And as time expired, buildings. I will call HPD myself. I will not allow, I will not allow them not to call my chief of staff back. I will reach out myself personally. So and do you call, and call you back personally? So we can set up maybe a meeting to get all this taken care of because we're getting ping pong back and forth between HPD and DHCR. And I've literally got rotting portions of my building that I'd like to get fixed. I, I know I, I had the the unfortunate to, to see firsthand. Yes. In your building. So I, I will I will make the call myself to HPD and call you personally by the end of this week. Thank you, sir. I look forward to hearing. Okay. Thank you, Lyric. Thank you. Before we move on to our final panelists, we had a, brief, a, a hand raised by Councilmember Chen. Do you have a question before we move on, Councilmember Chen? You're muted, Margaret. Yes, I'd like to ask a question of uh, Ms. Ayun uh, Kim from the uh, Federation about the survey that they did. Um, did you have a breakdown? Because when you talk about small businesses, uh, are you talking about, um, you know, small business owner, uh, retail business, uh, commercial building? Because they are governed by different agency. So I wanted to have a better sense because if it's like regular small businesses, it could be uh, the inspector could be coming from uh, Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, or it could be Department of Small Business Services. So I think it'll be good if you can provide, you know, the breakdown so that we can see which agency are the one that are responsible. And then we can work with them to make sure that is, you know, the issue that you raised about language access, about how to help the small, you know, businesses, um, you know, rectify their violation. I mean, those are important issues. Uh, so I think uh, if you can provide that to us, I think that would be great. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the question, Council Member. Uh, we do have a breakdown of the businesses, and most of them are retail or personal services um, and restaurants, um, naturally, because they're the most um, impacted as for Asian small businesses across the city. Um, we will be um, publishing a report on this as well, on the survey results and shortly. But to go back to your point about which agencies are dealing with the small businesses, for example, um, the Illegal Conversions Task Force, um, mm -hmm. which I think used to be about apartments before, um, 
are also being part of the small business regulations program right now, I, as far as I'm aware. And DOB is also part of this task force. And the problem that I want to highlight in this hearing is that there really is not one city agency that each industry is being dealt, uh, it needs to deal with at this time. Everybody's scrambling and, and the city agencies are sending different, age, um, different inspectors to deal with um, um, businesses that were of like different nature compared to non-COVID times. But the problem actually is that the information that the small business owners receive on their end are coming from all the different business, uh, all the different city agencies. So a small business owner who runs like a restaurant, for example, would look at a DOT um, regulation um, in material base about the open restroom program and think that they followed through all the regulations. But then later on, they're visited by FDNY along with the UOB inspectors saying that they did something that's like an attachment to the building and that mm -hmm. is not allowed. There is not a comprehensive information that's being sent out to small business owners. I think Council Member Chen, I think you're hitting a really great point in the sense that like this kind of information needs to be dealt with um, in the sense that like the receiving end needs to get needs to, needs to um, get a comprehensive information about like everything that they need to do. But right now they're just dealing with like each and every different information that comes out without language access in time and without any, a lot of like assistance to follow up with questions and uh, questions. Um, there is the um, there is the small business um, services um, hotline, but that is also like very limited in terms of language capacity. So what we ask actually is that DOB inspectors, because they are the most commonly um, going around right now to um, deal with the, the COVID regulations, as far as we understand, there was an incident in Brooklyn, for example, where a DOB inspector came, did a whole sweep on the, on the street, and then did not talk to them in their language, but kind of like gave them a link to a DOB um, agency website saying, you just need to do whatever is on the website. That's not assistance. That doesn't give them any information about what they need to do. And more importantly, there are other information that sh they should have been given too. But then what makes things worse is that a few days later, the same inspector comes back to that spot, does another sweep around the same street and say, I gave you all the information. You did not um, adhere to anything I told you. So here are the summons, here are the tickets. And there really is no chance for any education to happen or any information dissemination to happen in a meaningful way. So the small business owners always end up feeling like they're targeted. Yeah, thank you for that. I think for, you know, the businesses in Brooklyn, I mean, if you can provide us information, we can send that over to the commissioner. I don't think she's on, you know, still on the, um, the meeting, but definitely that's something that she can look into uh, in terms of inspectors from the Department of Building, uh, making sure they're doing the right things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Our, uh, our final panelist today is Paula Stigo. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Hi, uh, my name is Paula Siegel. Thank you so much for making time for small businesses in, uh, by the, in, in this committee's busy schedule. Um, I'm a senior staff attorney at Take Root Justice. And Take Root Justice is a member of United for Small Business New York City, USBNYC. USBNYC is a coalition of community organizations across New York City fighting to protect small business and non-residential tenants from the threat of displacement with a focus on owner-operated minority-run businesses that serve low-income and minority communities. We are also one of the providers on the Department of Small Business Services Commercial Lease Assistance Program. So we have a contract, a very small contract from the, from SBS where we are able to provide direct negotiation services as attorneys for small businesses. The need for those services has been astronomical since last March. Um, it was already it was already a lot um, as tenants were struggling with increasing rents and with the you know, with the heated up real estate market of New York City, but then of course COVID, created a situation where the state and city governments were telling small businesses that they had to close, but not providing them with any tools for negotiating their obligations with their landlords. So we've been assisting with that and getting a real front row seat to how our current system is just shifting the economic burden of the pandemic 
onto those who are least able to bear it. The banks shift it to landlords, the landlords shift it to tenants, and everybody says they're just following the law. And unfortunately, they are. Um, and so I'm grateful to this council for helping restore funding for the commercial lease assistance program earlier this year when the administration threatened to cut it, but restored funding for Time attorneys is not enough, if I may. Um, I would like to ask the council to pass a resolution in support of, a, of state bills um, that are called the Save Our Storefronts bills to consider using your own powers to impact and can partially cancel commercial rents for tenants in the city. Um, the MTA put out a perfect program that would be great to be, to be implemented as law instead of just something voluntary that a single landlord does and to schedule a hearing on the commercial rent stabilization bill that, has been, that was introduced before COVID at the council in 1796 of 2019. Thank you so much. Well, Paula, can you send those recommendations directly to me? Yeah. Uh, yes, how? I would find it hard to believe, Paula, that you don't know how to get to me yet. But uh, if you could well, just I'll text it. you. <laughs> no, no, send it to my email address, please. Okay. The council email address. Yeah, okay. Thank Bye. you. Yep. Thank you. We actually have one more panelist. Um, Abraham Gross is up next. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Carnegie. How are you? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. Uh, I was in contact with you, I think it was about a month ago, uh, in the hearing on deed fraud. Uh, I shared with you that I had thousands of uh, examples of affordable properties that were just gifted um, to various privileged parties, and I reached out to your office, but I have not heard back. I'm wondering, respectfully, if would I also be able to ask for your personal involvement, possibly to, to call me about this important issue? Is that too much to ask for? No, sir. Um, so, so you said you reached out to my office and you got no response? That's correct. Okay. So if you could uh, use my email and send me your information, I will call you myself. I'd be very grateful for that. Um, okay. and, and if I may, uh, the other issue is um, there was a hearing in city council in January 14th, 2019 about the affordable housing application process. And Chair Cornegie, you asked very tough questions um, and you, you just, you demonstrated, you know, I'm a council member, I'm the chair, I'm gonna protect the public. And that was in January, 2019. But what I went through and what millions of others have gone through show that the application process is, is deeply flawed. And, um, you know, it's, it's as though they come to the hearing and the agencies actually corroborate the allegation that there are problems in the application process. But the question is, how to actually fix it because since that hearing was held there were millions more applicants that were harmed and you know time expired so so abraham while your time has expired here it hasn't expired with me i'm going to call you personally if you send me your okay. information. Where, where can i send that to uh it's it's <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if they'll allow me to do this but it's r cornegie at yes. council.myc.gov so it's just r cornegie with the general council email. Thank you very much. If you send that to me today, I'll respond by tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. This concludes our public testimony. If we've inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if that person could raise their hand using the Zoom raise hand function, we'll try to hear from you now. All right. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Cornegie to close the hearing. Uh, just so I can be clear to follow up on this is Paula, you're going to reach out, Abraham, you're going to reach out, and um, I'm going to actually reach out uh, to Lyric. Somebody's going to kill me for doing per, uh, personal uh, constituent services on uh, council committee time, but it is what it is. Thank you so much. Um, this is, We have a lot of hard work to do. 
um, especially as we intend to recover, you know, have recovery and resiliency. We cannot leave our tenants right. We cannot leave our commercial tenants rights. Um, that's the only way we're going to get back to a place of any sanity is in this city is to simultaneously look out for both. They're not mutually exclusive. Um, uh, thank you so much for this hearing um, and we'll continue this work.